Okay, so we're going to be talking um, mostly about CMORs today, but to begin with, I'm going to talk about just generally about condition motivating operations, the different kinds that there are, and then we'll start going over the article and then talk a little bit about DTT. So um, I feel like this one has more stuff to cover than our last one, and I like just barely made it to the end. So I may go a little bit over an hour for this one. If you have to leave right at um, 1030 or whatever time it is where you live, that's fine. Um, but I just... I definitely want to make sure I get to the end because that's where all the information is on like, you know, helpful tips for like running DTT sessions. So, all right. So, uh, did everybody watch the videos also? Anyone? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> I was like, is my mic not working? <laughs> Okay, yeah, I just want to make sure that you watch the video and you actually got to see some of that because I won't be showing the video on here. Um, and then really just kind of skimming the article because we'll go through it more today. So uh, motivating operations. So, you know, these are environmental variables that alter the effectiveness of the stimulus as a reinforcer. So that's value altering. And they alter the frequency of behaviors that have been reinforced by that stimulus, which is behavior altering. Um, they also can have the the also the effects that they also have are establishing or abolishing operations. So this increases the effectiveness of the stimulus as a reinforcer or decreases the effectiveness of the stimulus as a reinforcer. So the thing to remember and definitely make note of this for your exam because it's a really um, it can get confusing otherwise. So establishing and abolishing effects are for value altering, and evocative or abative effects are for behavior altering. Uh, so both of them have V's in it, so I try and remember like the V in the middle goes with behavior, but find a way to remember that, um, you know, because you, you, sometimes they're not going to say if it's value altering or behavior altering, they're just going to use establishing or evocative, and that's what's going to help you determine whether it's changing the effectiveness of the stimulus or if it's altering the frequency of behaviors. So, um, and SDs and motivating operations are not the same thing. So most of this information that I got for this PowerPoint to go over uh, condition motivating operations are from uh, PowerPoint on the Jack Michaels website. So there's a link to it down there. And again, I'll share these PowerPoints with you. So, you know, definitely if you want more details about this, definitely look there. Um, but a lot of these examples and stuff are pulled directly from that. So the altering effects of MOs. The establishing operations, so those are anything that increases the value of whatever it is as a reinforcer. So being cold, that increases the value of warmth as a reinforcer. Uh, being thirsty increases the value of water as a reinforcer. Not being allowed the iPad all day, that would increase the value of the iPad as a reinforcer. And if you're using a TV remote and it doesn't work, and it's because of batteries, um, that increases the value of batteries as a reinforcer. So the abolishing, that's the opposite of that. It abolishes or decreases the value of these things as a reinforcer. So if you just drink a whole bunch of water, then that abolishes water as a reinforcer. So water is less value to, valuable to you because you just had a whole bunch of water. Same with the iPad. You know, if the our clients are playing with the iPad all day, um, it's less valuable to them as a reinforcer. And for a TV remote, you don't just want batteries all the time, you only need them when something is out of batteries. So if you have a working TV remote, you just put new batteries on it, then it makes batteries not valuable as a reinforcer. Do you have any questions about these two, um, two different sections here? Okay, so types of MOs, there's unconditioned and conditioned MOs. So unconditioned, you know, that's anything that's unconditioned, stimulus, unconditioned reinforcer. So food, water, oxygen, sleep, and shelter, which would be like temperature or staying dry. Um, and then conditioned motivating operations, so all learned reinforcers, iPad, batteries, money, toys, anything like that. 
So transitive CMO, which is also labeled as CMOT, um, there's three different types of CMOs. There's going to be transitive, surrogate, and reflexive. Um, reflexive is the CMOR, so we'll go over that one last. But a transitive CMO, so that's an environmental variable that's related to the relation between another stimulus and some other form of reinforcement and thus establishes the reinforcing effectiveness of the other stimulus and evokes all behavior that has produced that stimulus. So that is sounds really crazy um, and really long and circular. So, uh, but that's that is the actual definition of it. So the what this basically means, you know, an example with like rat studies. So there's a tone on, and then, you know, a couple seconds later, food and the tone are presented. So food deprivation is a CMOT for the reinforcer effectiveness of the tone. So normally, a tone is not valuable at all to a rat. The rat doesn't care if there's a tone or not. But when tone comes before a food pellet reliably, then anything that they can do to make the tone come on is valuable because that means that food is coming. Does that example make sense to you guys? Yes. Yeah. Great. Yeah. So I really, um, again, this is from the other PowerPoint, but I really love this example. Um, you know, it really made me think about these things. So a uh, real life example, if the power goes out in a storm and there's sudden darkness, that's a CMOT for getting a flashlight. So the sudden darkness, that's not an SD for looking for a flashlight because flashlights are not more available in the dark, which is what an SD means. They are more valuable in the dark. So that's why it would be a CMOT and not an SD. So any stimulus that can be the basis for a MAND also by arranging, by arranging the environment, that is also a CMOT. So, um, you know, a lot of the things that we have our kids MAND for, the, you know, they're not more available when they man for them. It's just that, you know, it's a CMOT. It's something that they're motivated for. So if a pencil mark on a piece of paper is required for an opportunity to play with their favorite toy, then mans for pencils and a piece of paper can be taught, not because it's SD, but because it's a CMOT. And then surrogate CMO, uh, which is the CMOS. Uh, so this says that pairing a stimulus with an MO, that stimulus will get the same evocative or establishing effects as the MO it was paired with. So there's not a whole lot of, you, there's some research showing that this is a thing, but it's not very strong and it doesn't really replicate in real life situations. Um, but, you know, an example of it, you know, is that if a stimul stimulus is paired with the unconditioned motivating operation of being too cold, it might increase the reinforcing effectiveness of warmth and evoke behavior that has been reinforced uh, to get warmth. So both of that would be appropriate, more appropriate than like the existing temperature necessitates. So it's kind of like a, like a duplicating effect. Um, but again, there's not a lot of not a lot of uh, evidence for this in real life scenarios. Um, and then the other PowerPoint was talking about how it's not, um, it's not really a, something that's needed for survival for like evolutionary um, standards. It's, it's not something that's, that's as important as the other two. Um, so you won't really have to worry too much about this. Definitely know what it is, because uh, I'm sure it will be on the exam, but just remember there's, you know, there's not a lot of strong evidence suggesting that this is a real thing. And then reflexive CMO. So this is the one we're mostly going to be talking about today. So this is a stimulus that has systematically preceded the onset of an any avoidable worsening. So a CMOR means that things could potentially get worse for you. So kind of like the other table that I showed you with the tone and then the food was presented. If you have a tone before and like the tone continues and then you turn on shock for the rat in the cage, the tone becomes the CMOR and evokes escape avoidance behavior. So you pair the tone and the shock with the tone starting first for several times. As soon as the rat hears the tone, they're going to start 
you know, having those escape or avoidance behaviors, even though they're not being shocked yet. So even things that, you know, you don't think that it means that there's a worsening, like somebody asking you, where is the library? It's an SD for a response, but it's also a warning stimulus that if a response is not given, um, you know, things will get worse. So if somebody says, where's the library? And you're just standing there and you don't respond, you don't say anything. Um, there's going to be awkward silence. They're going to look at you like, you know, do you understand me? They might repeat the question louder. Uh, so it is, it is actually a warning stimulus as well as an SD for the response. And then in our situation, which we probably encounter a lot, uh, the presentation of a teacher or therapy materials or a table, those are a CMOR that life is about to get worse for you um, and evokes escape and avoidance behavior. So, you know, those kids that you have that you come in the room and they try and run away from you or they scream or you put them at the table and they like straighten out and just start crying and try and get away before you've even done anything. Um, basically all of those things have been paired as CMORs that life is about to get worse for you. So they try and avoid it before anything has even happened. Um, so do you guys have kids like that? Have you seen this? <laughs> yes. Yes. Good. Yeah. Well, not good, but good that we can work <laughs> on it. <laughs> so the video, uh, that I sent you guys, that, that is a very great example. Like that girl did not want to do anything when she was first brought to the table. Like she would do anything to get away. <laughs> All right. So article discussion, I'm going to pull up the article now and then, you know, we can go over these questions as well afterwards. Um, but I definitely recommend that you check out uh, Vincent Carbone's website for more materials and resources. He has data sheets. He has other articles on there. Uh, additional videos, PowerPoints of talks that he's given. So uh, definitely check that out. He's like my current favorite person in ABA right now. So, <laughs> all right. So let's go to the article. All right. So this was uh, done in 2010. Um, so it's the role of reflexive condition motivate condition motivating operations or CMOR during discrete trial instruction of children with autism. So the purpose of this, hold on, I need to scroll. All right, so I'm not gonna read through the whole thing, but I've just highlighted several areas in here that we're gonna go over. Um, you know, so like what's, what's the purpose of this? Did you guys read the beginning part? Okay, so what did you get from this? Like why, why is this important? Why did he write this article? Um, it might be to um, maybe give further explanation or further differentiation on the different motivating operations and how they all function in these or, you know, similarly or differently. Okay. Different, you know, specific examples. Yeah. Make sense? Yes. So the part that I highlighted here, which is a little bit of a large part, but I'm going to read through it, um, that I think, you know, really talks about why this is so important. Um, you know, it's, there's the tendency of children, you know, specifically our children with autism to engage in high rates of escape and avoidance behavior. So we've all seen that um, within instructional and demand settings. So the methods that increase the motivation to respond may be essential for providing long-term positive outcomes. I mean, we need to make the learning environment not awful for our, for our clients in order to get them to, to learn. Um, so it's really important uh, for, you know, kids with autism, uh, and it's right over here, uh, because they frequently fail to learn through exposure to the typical social environment. So as an alternative to mere exposure to everyday experiences, the methods of discrete trial instruction have been demonstrated to be one of the most effective instructional tools for teaching important language, social, and cognitive skills. So basically, you know, there's there's sometimes uh, kind of avoidance of doing DTT and ABA because it's, you know, people think of like old school LOVAS of uh, DTT setups where like you're hitting the table when they write, make a wrong answer and you're shoving an M&M in a client's mouth, which is not what it needs to look like today. You know, we've 
definitely come a long way since then. <coughs> but if our kids were going to learn in the natural environment, like typical kids do, they would have yeah. learned these things already. Yes. So yes. that's where, you know, DTT is definitely important aspect to bring into your sessions because it's definitely been proven that you know, it's very successful in teaching kids with autism. You're going to get increased attending, decreased behaviors, but you have to do it correctly. Um, you know, so if they're if they're so so much trying to escape the learning environment, definitely trying to escape that setup of, you know, even sitting at a table. You know, at some point in their life, they're going to have to do that. But in able to be able to learn using discrete trials, they have to have those skills. So. Having our our work set up, our table, our room, ourselves even, anybody that looks like a teacher, if we are all CMORs, then all they're trying to do is get away from us or work to get away from us the whole time. So what sorts of situations have you guys seen uh, just in your work work environments? Do you see clients that have this? What does that look like? And have you have you tried anything with it? I've seen it look like um, physical aggression. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. like uh, pushing stuff away, hitting the teacher, pushing the teacher away, pushing yeah. the materials away, pushing the desk back, pushing the person back from the desk. Yeah, really just, um, you know, any behaviors that previously got them out of of doing things yeah. in the past. Crying, so. crying and stopping their feet, things like that. Uh-huh. So what have you done in those situations? You may have already read this and know how to do all these things in here, but uh, what, like, what are some of the things that you've tried to, you know, get them to, to come to the table or try to get them not hating your session? <laughs> um, the one thing I've done as the, in, a, in a clinical setting, I was first myself. Yeah, that's good. Um, you were breaking up some. Um, well, actually, it more sounds like you're underwater a little bit. I don't know if anyone else hears yeah. that. But uh, I did I did get some of the things that you were saying. So pairing is definitely something that, you know, anytime you've worked in an ABA setting, that's something that you'll do. And also, you know, slowly increasing the difficulty or increasing, you know, the amount of time that you spent working on it, you're not going to go like pairing for a couple of days and then, all right, let's get to work. Um, <laughs> and now we're doing, you know, uh, long amounts of, of work at a table. So yeah, definitely those things are, are helpful getting, getting kids to not dislike your session, trying to pair it as something that's more enjoyable. So, um, so then I just, uh, I'm kind of skipping this section on establishing that whole beginning part because we did just talk about that. Uh, so, you know, the main thing is that, so a CMOR, that's been implicated in, you know, several studies as an independent variable that affects the occurrences of problem behavior. So, you know, it's a real thing that they found in studies and that it definitely does impact the problem behavior that you'll see in your session. Um, There we go. Uh, so within this context, instructional demands act as aversive stimuli and therefore evoke problem behavior that has led to the removal of demands in the past. So, you know, that's exactly what you guys were describing, uh, what what you've seen in your in your sessions as well, that, 
you deliver a demand, like you could be pairing with the kid for like a week and everything's everything's great. But sometimes even still, even though you've paired yourself, you know, you deliver a demand to go sit at the table or you show them a flashcard and you ask them a question and immediately like that's a verse of stimulus and it's it's going to you know, they're gonna engage in any behaviors that has led them to get out of demands previously. So that's another thing, like when you're working with kids and, you know, they start having these escape behaviors, you know, it's gotten reinforced somewhere. So that's, that's where it comes from. You know, they're not going to, well, I mean, they could just be creative and think of something else, especially if you're putting it on extinction without replacement behaviors. But, um, you know, typically their go-to is going to be whatever they've been able to do to get out of that behavior previously. All right, so, um, and this table right here, uh, that is really similar to, you know, what was also in the PowerPoint as well. So um, this is just kind of going over more about the CMOR and, you know, how that is a signal for the worsening of the organism's life, basically. In that case, a rat, but in our case, children, um, that things are just getting worse for them. Okay, so I'm just going to read some of these highlighted sections here as well. Uh, so an important component of the intensive treatment model, which is, you know, discrete trial instruction. So within this re approach, behavioral tasks are divided into component activities. While the instructor is sitting at a child size table, he or she usually presents an instructional demand, waits for prompts, the correct response, um, and then provides a consequence for the child's response and then pauses for a few seconds before presenting the next instructional demand. So that is describing what DTT looks like. Have any of you guys used discrete trial training in your experience um, in your variety of work settings? Is it, is it really like a lot of one-on-one -on -one direct instruction? I mean, that's kind of like how I take it. Yeah. It is. So um, it, if you go to Carbone's website, there are videos of uh, some of the people that work for him doing DTT. Really what it looks like is you're sitting, you should be sitting across the table from the child, not next to or at a corner of, it should be across. And a lot of what you'll see with his stuff is uh, they have index cards. Uh, so, you know, it's, you don't have to think of the next trial. You just like flip the card and they're all mixed up. So, I mean, it's very rapid. Like, okay, what's your name? What color is yeah. this? Where does this go? Yeah. Show me the one that's jumping. You know, you're going pretty fast. You know, they have the time for them to actually respond. So, but otherwise, I mean, it's pretty back to back, uh, back to back demands very quickly. So, yeah. so. We use that in our, in our school. We have a program called STAR. Okay. And that's what we use for our one-to-one. Our -one Good. Time. Do you have any clients that like have like that that's set up as a CMOR, or has that been kind of trained out with them? Um, my newer client. That's what that's what he's doing right now because he's learned how to sit at a table. That was a lot of his programming is trying to sit at a table. Yeah. So that's what they use the the discrete trials Got it. for him. Okay. But my older ones, it's, it's being, it's, they're already past that. Okay. So they're already good with, you know, doing that. Um, and some of the things that you'll see is, you know, you can get to the point of with doing DTT that you're, you're going through a whole bunch of demands, a whole bunch of instructions, tasks, trials, whatever you want to call it. And then after like two to three minutes of that, when the client earns their reinforcement, they'll engage with a reinforcement for like 30 seconds and then you can go back to it and they're totally fine and it's worth it for them. And that's, you know, enough for them to be able to go and do work again, which, you know, definitely in a naturalistic setting, um, you know, you're not really, you're definitely not going to get that many trials. And, you know, the, if you're sitting there and you're slowly going through stuff and then we're going to go through all of, you know, the colors and the categories and then we're going to go through the actions and then like 10 minutes from now when you fill up your token board, they're not going to work for 30 seconds. Like no. that's not going to happen. No. <laughs> um, so that's where, you know, 
you don't do DTT your whole session. Um, exactly. Do it like exactly. short amounts and then move to naturalistic stuff for the rest of the time. But that will help you get a lot of teaching trials in. So this other section down here, you know, it emphasizes active learner responding to high rates of teacher presented instructional demands with the degree of learner cooperation affecting the benefit achieved. So, you know, it's it's a high rate of demands. Um, it's being presented by a teacher. You know, it's not necessarily presented in like a game or play type scenario. Um, you know, and it does require a high degree of learner cooperation. So the the client definitely has to cooperate with you to be able to do this effectively. Um, so just a couple more sections on here about, you know, the CMOR, uh, you know, the teacher, the materials, teacher's voice, the actual demands, all may begin to function as CMORs because of their correlation with instructional activities that represents a worsening set of conditions. So, you know, a lot of times we'll think of like painful stimulation is like the worsening set of conditions. And, you know, in the examples with the rats, it definitely is being shocked. But it can also be, you know, think about whenever you're sitting at a table doing this work with a client, it's a decrease in the rate of reinforcement if you're not doing it correctly. It's a decrease in the amount of, um, in the rate of reinforcement. There's less immediate reinforcement. There's greater response requirement, greater response effort. And all of those things equal a worsening of a condition. So it's a worsening to that client that, you know, you're not going to get as much reinforcement. You're going to have to put in a lot more effort. So that's how this can turn into a CMOR. And then there's this table here, which I think is great. So, you know, typically what happens, you present these things over time. They learn that all of this happens, you know, not directly, but, you know, you, oh, okay, when you start asking me questions about, you know, actions, I stop getting fun things, or I have to work really hard, or I keep getting the wrong answer, and I don't get prompted for the right answer. Like, all of these things are, they make the client's life worse. Um, so then the effect is that it turns into a CMOR. So then, later on, even before you get to these, you know, worsening set of conditions, when you just present what used to be a neutral stimuli, that they are now a CMOR. You present the instruction, you ask them to sit at the table, you arrive into their environment, and then you get the effects of the CMOR because it's been paired with this. And it doesn't mean that you did the pairing with this. It could have been another teacher or another therapist that didn't use ABA principles and paired these things together but you look kind of like that other teacher because you're an adult and you're in the school or you're in the therapy setting so that must mean that with you these things are also going to you know lead to these conditions so even though you're brand new you come in and you are also a warning stimulus for that client so basically this table shows how the cmo becomes conditioned yeah yeah, so this this shows how what should yeah. be neutral stimulus or even, you know, signal like we think that and we even like I even write it on my stuff that, oh, the SD is, you know, do this and then clap your hands. Well, that signals that reinforcement is available, but that doesn't matter if it's a CMOR because it's going to lead exact, you know, right to these effects. So. Right you know, all of this, what should be neutral stimulus or what we would think of as an SD, um, you know, it's been paired with worsening conditions. So therefore it turns into a CMOR even without these conditions being present. All right, so kind of like what I was talking about, the differentiating from the SD to the MO. So the discriminative stimulus derives control over responding through a special history of relationship with behavioral consequences. So think of our kids, like if I introduce a gross motor imitation program and they've never done it before, so is it really an SD? Because they have no history of, you know, clapping their hands when I say do this and getting reinforcement. It's brand new. They've never gotten that. Uh, so, you know, because instructional demands do not signal the availability of reinforcement for problem behavior, but instead make negative reinforcement in the form of task removal valuable, they're identified as MOs. So, um, you know, basically what it's saying is that establishing operations change how much people want something. And SDs 
change their chance of getting it. So an SD says that this is available, but an MO or a you know, establishing operations change if they want it or not, which, you know, we can look back and that's the same as the flashlight example. Um, you know, they're not more available, you just want them more when it's dark. So the, the thing that, you know, definitely want to think about here is, you know, we're, if we're not working on this, if we're not addressing the fact that we're CMORs, and you're just, your reinforcement for them working with you at the table is negative reinforcement that, you know, just do these things and then I'll leave you alone. Um, we're not teaching them how to how to learn. We're not teaching them how to, you know, be in these environments without having those behaviors. Exactly. All right. So um, reinterpreting ex existing treatments from a CMOR perspective. Um, I'm just going to read through these and then we're going to go over uh, how do we fix this? How do we uh, actually address this with our clients? Um, so with his analysis, um, Michael rejected the idea of merely removing the CMOR to reduce problem behavior because the presentation of frequent instructional demands is necessary is a necessary condition for learning with discrete trial instruction. So basically, you know, you can say, well, you know, just stop giving instructions. Yes, I can stop giving instructions and the kid will stop hitting me or stop trying to run away. <laughs> But that's not teaching them anything. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, you know, function altering effects of extinction could reduce problem behavior, but it would leave the CMOR, CMOR in place. So that's why just doing escape extinction is not helping. Like you're, you're teaching them that if they try and run away, they're still not going to get out of the demand, but they're still not going to want to be there because you're still paired with a worsening of conditions. Uh, so he stated that, let me make that go away, okay, uh, he stated that merely reducing the problem behavior while leaving the aversive nature of the demand situation unresolved is unsatisfactory, which, you know, I agree with. We definitely, um, you know, we can change their behavior, but we need to change their motivation. So he suggested that, you know, we're obligated to reduce the problem behavior, but also alter the challenging environment encountered by most people with autism and developmental disabilities, which, you know, that's definitely an important part of our field is not just, you know, making it stop, but also making this functional so our kids can learn from other environments. Um, okay. Um, and then also it was kind of going over here, it was talking about, you know, antecedent behavior reduction procedures, um, you know, like high probability or, you know, things like that. They're all listed up here. Um, but a lot of those can be kind of reinterpreted in terms of modifying the CMOR. Uh, so, you know, uh, high probability tasks or reducing learner errors, all of those are types of... Um, you know, a types of methods to reduce the effect of the CMOR as well. Um, let's see if I want to go over any other questions here. Okay. Um, got it. Does everyone understand how an SD is not the same as an MO? Okay. I'll take that as a yes. Yes. <laughs> And um, is everyone clear on why we should not just remove the CMOR, which is the instruction? Everyone good on yes. that? So. Great. Have to have instruction. <laughs> yeah. You have to learn that. Yes. Okay. Um, all right. So the first one uh, that we're going to go over is programming uh, competing reinforcers. So um, behavior that's maintained by negative reinforcement can be weakened by programming positive reinforcement for an alternative compliant response or by delivering it non-contingency during high demand situations. Um, so, you know, you saw some of that in, in the video with Carbone that she's sitting there watching Barney the whole time and, you know, the puzzle is in front of her. And then, you know, he gets her to do a little bit of the puzzle and she continues watching Barney. So that's pretty much, it was continuously non-contingently in place. Um, and it wasn't during high demand. It was just the beginning of it. Um, but you know, she got to do that and then she got to watch Barney. Um, somebody is, 
phone is making lots of noise. <laughs> Could you mute it? Let me see. I don't know who it is. <laughs> Christy, it may be you because I think you mentioned that you were at a ball game. <laughs> okay, I'm still hearing it. I'll just talk over it. Uh, so the researchers demonstrated with this with this method here um, that the introduction of positive reinforcement for responses that were alternatives to the negative problem behavior reduced the problem behavior without modification of making maintaining the contingency and in some cases without the use of extinction for the problem behavior. Um, so this isn't necessarily just asking for a break, but you know it should. We should try and teach our kids, you know, if they want to watch the Barney video, like that was in that example, which I don't know that any of our kids actually watch that anymore. Um, but, you know, teach them to request for that. So yeah. they're not necessarily just escaping from, they're not just running away from you as soon as you are done placing demands. It's something that they can still stay in that environment at the table and then engage in you know, whatever that behavior is, and then you're reinforcing them for responding correctly with the thing that they've requested. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, I'm just going to scan through this. Yeah, so this, this right here, this section, this kind of talks about how they did that. So a child with autism was provided the opportunity to either choose a potato chip or a break after completing a certain number of responses. So when the demands were low, they always chose that they wanted the potato chip. But then when the demands were higher, um, then they requested to have a break. So using this in addition to some of the other things that we're going to go over is going to be helpful for, you know, if you make the, if you make the situation really aversive, which is a CMOR, then they're likely just going to want to get away from you. Um, so we want to definitely provide positive reinforcement instead of negative reinforcement, and then also use these other strategies to make it not so um, demanding or awful for them. <laughs> now pairing. So this is one that I'm sure we are all familiar with. So you pair um, and embed the teaching context, personnel, materials, and so forth with an improving set of conditions through the delivery of positive reinforcement. Now, how we typically do this, I feel like is, you know, maybe not, maybe not done as well as it should be done. So what I mean is, you know, when you're, if you're at an ABA clinic, you're going to be given a new kid and told to pair with them. So you're going to just play with them for days. <laughs> uh, just play with them, hang out with them, give them all the things that they want. But you've not paired your teaching materials, and you've not paired the table, you've not paired these other things. So then, you've played with them for like a week, and then you go and you try and do work with them, and they still have behaviors. Because it's not necessarily you that's the CMOR at this point, but it's all the other things that you didn't pair. So, it's almost like what that person represents. Yeah. Um, well... I mean, you may represent a CMOR when you first get them if they've had experience with teachers making their life worse. But that's why you do the pairing. But you have to pair everything else as well. So if you have a client that, you know, is paired well with you, but then you try and get them to sit at a table and they start crying or they try and get up and run away, you need to pair the table as well. So do things that are super fun at the table. You know, play Play-Doh at the table. If they have a certain video they like, you know, do that at the table. So we also make, have to make sure that we pair our, our work environment and even our materials. Um, if you're using flashcards or if you're, you know, whatever materials you'll be using for your programs, you know, play with them also. Um, I know when I did speech therapy, I had articulation cards and I would put them under those magnetic fish. So they would play the fishing game and pick it up and then, oh, there's a card under there. Um, oh. Say this sound. <laughs> uh, but I didn't know that I was pairing them at that time. Uh, it was before I learned ABA, but, you know, doing that is pairing the material with something that's really fun. So, you know, definitely pair all the things you'll be using, not just yourself. And then um, errorless instruction. Uh, so when students make frequent errors during instructional session sessions, 
the levels of problem behavior are high. So, I mean, think of that with you too. If you're trying to learn something and you keep on making mistakes, you're going to get super annoyed and not want to do this anymore. Exactly. <laughs> um, anybody that has tried to put together IKEA furniture probably has experienced this. <laughs> um, so instructional methods that reduce the frequency of errors have been demonstrated to reduce the level of problem behavior. So if the instructor, instructor prevents or minimizes the errors, um, then the CMOR is abolished and students engage in fewer problem behaviors. So what this is going to look like is prompt fading. So like, let's go back to the gross motor imitation example. So if I say do this and I clap my hands and then you don't clap your hands, and I just like, okay, no, do this. And I clap my hands and you're still not doing it. And I do that a few times. Well, I'm not teaching you anything. So, you know, you're going to take baseline data is what you should do before you start any new target. First, see, do they know how to do it or do they not know how to do it? Once we see, like, can they do it or not, that will give us a better idea of where to start with our prompting. So if it's a brand new skill and they've never done any sort of gross motor imitation before, you need to start with a full physical prompt. So I say do this and I clap my hands, then I grab your hands and I clap your hands too. And then I reinforce you just as if you did it by yourself. Um, that's another thing that gets lost sometimes is like the reinforcement isn't as exciting because you had to do it for them. But... They let you do it for them, so we're still going to reinforce them for it. So we have to start in a in a prompt level that they're going to be very successful with so they can access reinforcement. Um, just thinking about the definition of reinforcement is that it increases any of the behaviors that it follows. Well, if you have a client that isn't good on a skill and they never access the reinforcement, how are you ever going to increase that skill? So they have to be able to access reinforcement. And then we have stimulus demand fading. Um, so researchers have shown that escape motivated problem behavior can be virtually eliminated by removing the demands, but we've already determined that this is not practical. Uh, so other things that you can do is, um, you know, you can alter the, the demands by, um, you know, changing the task difficulty, uh, adding in a number of low probability requests, uh, decreasing the response effort, or varying the number or rate of instructional trials. So um, over successive sessions, more demands were faded into the session. Uh, so you'll start with, you know, what they were talking about here is that you may start just like being there with the client and then do like a couple of demands. And then over the sessions, fade in more demands. So you're going to do it in a slow, slow process. Um, again, if you just go in and you give a whole bunch of demands, that's going to be problematic. Sorry. <laughs> My phone made a noise and the dog that I'm baby babysitting is freaking out. <laughs> um, all right. So you know, and it's not just the number of instructional trials, you know, it's also the task difficulty. And I think that is also listed in a different one over here. But it should be like, you really should aim for 80% easy task to 20% difficult tasks. So maybe two out of the 10 trials that you're doing are brand new things that they don't know how to do. And then the rest of them are things that you've been working on for a little bit longer or even some maintenance trials. So making sure that not all of your tasks are difficult. Okay. Um, so is that where you could bring like your high P request sequence in? Yeah. Yeah. And doing your pairing with things like that as well? Yeah, well this is um this would be more when you're not doing pairing, but once you start going into the session, I mean yeah, definitely incorporate a lot of things that are easier for the client. Um and then you know, kind of go, go from there and slowly start adding in more things. Um, but even still, I wouldn't change that ratio of difficult to easy tasks because if you're doing like 80% hard tasks and 20% easy tasks, regardless of how long you've been doing this for, you're still going to, you know, that's still going to turn your session into a CMOR. Yeah. So task variation, also really important. Um, so one of the things that, you know, people think about when they think of DTT is that you're just doing mass trials 
um, with the same stimulus and don't ever do that because that's awful. Um, which I really like yes. that it even said up here, um, I highlighted it, uh, to every, to use everyday language, doing the same task over and over again is boring. So exactly. it is, it's boring. If I it make is. you, um, you know, if I make you do the same gross motor imitation over and over again till I get my 20 trials, one, you're not learning anything because after yeah. like the first couple, you're like, oh, okay, I get what you're doing. And then also it's really boring. Like nobody wants to do that. So it's really important to vary the tasks that you're doing. So in the videos that you'll see, which I don't know, I don't think it showed it on hers, but on his website, Carbone's website, on the DTT videos that they have up there, um, you'll see them using index cards of different colors. Uh, so each color is a different verbal domain and you shuffle them up. So you shouldn't have like you know, five red cards together because that would all be like listener responding or something. So, you know, just varying the different domains that you're targeting and varying the stimulus that you're using is going to help it not be boring. And then the pace of instruction. And I actually, um, at the end of this PowerPoint, um, which I can skip over to it now, uh, I have some graphs for this. So basically children exhibited less off task behavior and acquired more skill during brisk paced instruction. Uh, so during the uh, ITI, which is the inter trial intervals, um, reinforcement is not available. And with longer inter trial intervals as compared, compared to shorter, the child receives a lower rate of reinforcement for instructional sessions of equal duration. So basically, if I ask you something, and then I wait 10 seconds, and then I ask you something again, well, if we're using a token board, you're still going to need to get 10 correct answers or whatever it is. So if I'm going slower, that means you're going to get less reinforcement, and it's going to take you longer to get that reinforcement. So that's why, you know, if you are going at a fast pace, um, you know, the kids are going to have less off task behavior um, and less impulsivity. Basically, they don't have a chance to engage in their behavior because they're so focused on the task because of the rate that you're going. Um, and then down here, you know, it appears that these children, well, it says children who do not engage in off task behaviors and are impulsive they're unlikely to benefit from the fast pace. So if they're not if they're not off off task and you haven't seen that behavior from them, then this doesn't matter as much. This is for the kids that are trying to get away from you and engaging in the behavior. Um, but then it does note that those child children that don't engage in the off task behavior, they're less likely to try and escape from the situation anyways. Uh, so before I go on to the next one, I'm going to uh, show you the graph. So uh, if you click on this, this will take you to uh, the link uh, for this article, but it's also on Carbone's website. So they actually uh, looked at, this is, I have it broken up into two slides. So it's the frequency of problem behaviors per session. Uh, and this is with one student, David. They did slow intertrial intervals with 10 seconds in between medium with five seconds in between and fast with one second in between. So you can see that the slow, that's a lot more problem behavior than with the fast. So like this is a beautiful graph um, that you can clearly see the difference between these. And then this is the same thing just with a different client, Sarah. Um, again, slow, you get a lot more problem behaviors than with medium or with fast. And down here with fast, like she had instances where she had no problem behavior. So going at a rapid pace is definitely good for abolishing the motivation to get away. And then um, a couple more. We have neutralizing routines. Um, basically, uh, I'm not going to read through this whole one, but what they're saying is that, you know, anytime that there's outside variables that aren't even related to your session, like maybe the kid went to the doctor and got a shot right before they came to therapy, or before they came to school, uh, that's going to also establish the session as a CMOR. Um, so, you know, giving them time to play first, um, you know, giving them highly preferred activities at the beginning and then going into teaching trials, you know, to try and neutralize 
that effect from what had previously happened outside of your session, uh, which I mean, I think that's good to do with any kid. Like I don't really start sessions and go right into let's do all the work. Um, you know, you get your client or your student, uh, do a little bit of fun stuff and then go into working. Uh, so then that will help neutralize any, any outside variables that you're not aware of. Yeah. Cause I usually went with my clients and my students. I always ask the parents, how was their morning? How was or how was their day at school? To, so I know what I'm what I'm dealing with before we start. Yeah, that's You're definitely welcome. a good strategy. Um, and then we have choice making. Um, Again, so problem behavior was dramatically reduced when students were offered choices of activities and reinforcers during the instructional sessions. So you always, um, for all kids that can tell you this either verbally or non-verbally, um, always want them to pick their reinforcers. So set that up before you start your trials. What do you want to work for? And they can change it later. It doesn't matter. It's their reinforcer. Um, you know, but giving them those choices. And if you're able to program for you know, choices in a DTT session, you know, definitely do that as well. Uh, if you have kids that do not have a lot of escape behavior, uh, like they were talking about with the fast pace and you don't need to keep a fast pace, you can even put down, you know, five cards that have like tasks on the back of them and have them pick a card, you know, um, if you're working on actions or labeling or something like that and you have cards and, you know, you're working on like three or five different targets, like put them down and have them pick one. Um, even something like that where they're still having to do the work, um, giving them choices is going to give them a little bit more control in the situation yeah. and also reduce problem behavior. And you're still getting the work done. It's just, you know, they get to have some input on what what that looks like and which ones you're working on. Um, and then interspersal instruction. So problem behavior can be uh, reduced when easy tasks are interspersed with difficult tasks. And this is basically what I was talking about previously. So difficult tasks, you know, it says probably function as a CMOR because they're correlated with low rates of reinforcement, high rates of error, and higher rates of social disapproval. So difficult things are not fun to do. Usually it means that things are going to get worse for you because you don't know how to do it. So, you know, imagine if I was to give you like a calculus math assignment right now, like that, that would not be fun. Um, so, uh, you know, if I gave you an easy math assignment with maybe one calculus problem on there, it wouldn't be such a big deal. Like you wouldn't hate the fact that I brought you to this table and gave you this work assignment to do. So putting in easier tasks, it's going to reduce this effect of difficult tasks, making the whole session become a CMOR because you're just going to intersperse a few difficult tasks. And especially if you're using the errorless teaching with difficult tasks, that's going to make it even better. So yes, this is hard and you don't know how to do it, but you're not going to have a whole lot of these hard ones and I'm going to help you do them. That's going to make the session a lot better. And then task novelty, novelty, there we go, <laughs> task novelty. <laughs> uh, so the presentation of a novel task may serve as a CMOR, and that is similar to, well, it can be similar to the difficult task. So the fact that it's new may be associated with new things are hard. Um, but what you could do with novel task is one, you know, don't give them a whole bunch of novel tasks all at once, just like with the difficult task, and gradually introduce it. Um, and that's going to help the the value of task removal as a reinforcer become low. So really, you can do it just as exposure. So maybe you're going to work with some sequencing cards that the client has to put together. Well, the session before you work on it, maybe get them out and have them on the table but don't make them do anything with it yet. And then maybe get them out and like show them how you put them together, but don't give them the demand yet. And then you can give them the demand for, you know, one or two of them, but then, you know, slowly increase the amount of okay. trials that you do with that. Uh, so just slowly introduce those things um, because just know that, you know, novel tasks may be difficult for that client as well. And that can kind of go along with also, um, 
not just the fact that it's a novel task, but changing their routine as well. Um, when you do DTT and you're mixing things up very regularly, that does help because it makes it not very predictable what you're going to do next. But if you introduce something that's completely new with new materials, they're going to notice. Um, so just slowly oh, yeah. presenting it, that will help with that as well. Um, and then the session duration. So there were two different things that they found with this. Uh, there were some participants that had little or no problem behavior at the beginning of the session, but then higher rates at the end of the session. And that's definitely what I see a lot more of. But then they found participants that engaged in high rates of problem behavior at the beginning of the session, but then the rate decreased over the length of the session. So depending on what type of client you're working with, you may want to change your session duration and the frequency as well. So if you have clients that are good at the beginning and have more behaviors at the end, then you would want to have more frequent sessions of shorter duration. Um, if you have the other type of client that has high rates of behavior at the beginning but then gets better as you go on, then you would want to have fewer sessions that are longer because you know that will decrease the the behaviors for both types of clients so just pay attention to what type of client it is that you're working with again i feel like the ones that i see more frequently are the higher rates towards the end of the session like if you get to minute 15 they're like i want to be done now um and you've lost all all of their attention um but you know if you have the other one just just pay attention to when the behaviors occur and that will help as well so um then there's the conclusion i don't really have anything about that but the last thing i wanted to go over and we're actually really good on time which is great um so i kind of took all of this information and just made one slide for tips for successful dtt so let me just make that bigger so we can see it uh, so you want to teach alternatives to negatively reinforced problem behaviors. So that's where, you know, you're teaching them responses or teaching them things to do to get positive reinforcement. You want to pair the teaching environment and the materials with positive reinforcement, not just yourself. Use errorless instruction with most to least response prompting and then fade it with a time delay and then fade through till you're doing the least prompting. Uh, you'll want to slowly add in the number of demands and alter the dimensions of the demands. So that includes task difficulty, number of low probability requests, response effort, and number of trials. Vary the tasks or verbal behavior domains, so no mass trials on the same stimulus. Be aware of outside variables that establish the session as a CMOR, and that could look like lack of sleep or a doctor's visit beforehand, anything like that. Allow the client to choose the reinforcers and activities within the trials when possible. Uh, intersperse easy or even maintenance tasks and with more difficult tasks. So if you're in like an ABA clinic setting, or I think you could probably even do it in a speech setting, um, and you're there working on trials, include things that have already been mastered. Um, those are definitely known as easy things. So include those, include those maintenance tasks. And then you're also programming for uh, generalization across time, make sure that they're maintaining those uh, other tasks that they've already mastered, and then have fewer difficult or new tasks in the group. And then you'll want to gradually expose, expose clients to new tasks or novel stimuli, and then vary your session duration based on when problem behaviors occur. Do you guys have any questions over this? Um, any of those types of strategies for making uh, DTT more successful. And you're going to put this in your, uh, on your website, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so you guys will have access to this. Um, yeah. So any questions on any of this no. or comments? <laughs> no. <laughs> All right. Well, that's all I had then. Um, if you guys think of any other questions, um, feel free to email me. Uh, definitely check out the website and look at some of those other videos of DTT. If you have questions on that once you watch them, let me know. Um, but otherwise, you know, I've begun implementing a lot of this stuff in my sessions with my clients as well, and I definitely find it to be really, really reinforcing. So, you know, even a few months from now when you've kind of forgotten about this presentation and 
um, you have a client that's starting to engage in these behaviors, you know, maybe even just print out this one slide and keep that yeah. and try and remember those things. So put that in my classroom. Yeah. <laughs> Post it up everywhere. Exactly. <laughs> all right. Well, that's all I have. So um, I will see you guys in a couple of weeks for our next um, our next group supervision. And just let me know if you need anything. Okay. Okay. Right. Thank, Thank you. you.